Millions of viewers tuned in to an explosive docu-series detailing allegations of a toxic workplace culture and harassment against a former children's television show producer who was the creative mind behind popular children's TV shows such as The Amanda Show, Drake and Josh, Victorious, and iCarly. But arguably the biggest bombshell of the entire series came from former child star Drake Bell, who revealed he was sexually abused by a dialogue coach who worked for the network when he was a teenager. On Sunday, the makers of the series released a new episode with new revelations. The fifth episode differed from other episodes in the series in that it was a sit-down interview hosted by Soledad O'Brien where they revisited the troubling revelations from the series. The episode kicks off with O'Brien interviewing Drake Bell, who during the series explained how dialogue coach Brian Peck subjected him to extensive and brutal sexual abuse while the two worked together. The episode kicks off with O'Brien interviewing Drake Bell, who during the series explained how dialogue coach Brian Peck subjected him to extensive and brutal sexual abuse while the two worked together. Bell, who starred in Nickelodeon shows such as The Amanda Show and Drake and Josh, detailed how the abuse began. He said Peck drove a wedge between him and his father, who was his manager at the time. Bell's father, who appeared in the docu-series, but not the fifth episode, said at the time he believed Peck was dangerous, even voicing his concerns to production, but said those claims went unanswered. Bell ended up firing his father and living with his mother, who took on the managerial responsibilities from her home in Orange County, California. But since Bell had auditions miles away in Los Angeles, Peck took on the role of driving the then teenage actor to auditions and to and from set, sometimes keeping Bell at his home overnight. Bell said that's how the abuse began. And while he didn't go into heavy detail on camera about the extent of the sexual abuse, he at the time told the interviewer, imagine the worst stuff that someone could do to somebody as a sexual assault. And that would answer the question. Bell said the abuse wasn't a one-time incident, as he expressed he felt trapped with no way out. The revelation left many viewers heartbroken. And while many viewers expressed outrage toward Brian Peck, some were also critical of Drake Bell's mother, who had left him in the care of Peck despite Bell's father's wishes. And we gotta be careful looking back because we have the end of the story and she did not. During the fifth episode, Drake defended his mother, saying Peck was calculated and pulled the wool over everyone's eyes. As forensic psychologist Dr. Joni Johnston explains, many parents may have just assumed their child was in safe hands. And so I think that there are probably many parents back then who were very naive about child safety. They assumed if my child is working for a television show that revolves around children or revolves around teenagers, they're going to be safe. And so I think that it's something probably his mom has had to really grapple with and, you know, think about and, you know, revisit that herself. But I think it is important not to be too critical of her position because one of the things I know that, that Drake has said very publicly is that, you know, he was very charismatic, that Brian Peck was very charismatic, that he was able to talk people into a lot of different things. He was manipulative. He was charming. And, you know, given that context, uh, it doesn't surprise me that she was either unable or reluctant or a combination of the two to think that somebody in that position, who is a children's dialogue coach, would be doing something like that or even want to do something like that. I think the whole concept of grooming is so important to understand because oftentimes when you're talking about children, the, you know, the predator really isn't just necessarily grooming the child. They're also in some ways grooming the parent or at least attempting to, if they can. And if they can't do that, then they're likely to separate, to try to find some wedge that they can kind of put in between that parent and that child. But certainly we're talking about grooming for children. In some respects, there's a parallel with domestic violence, meaning that nobody gets into a domestic violence situation. They get into a good relationship that becomes uh, violent. And I think it's the same thing when we talk about sexual abuse or a predator. They start out being this person's friend, this, oh, you're so special. I'm going to help you advance your career. I'm your buddy. They may confide things and make this person feel like they're grown up or there's all different ways, giving them gifts or taking them on special outings. They really, in some respects, almost love bomb them in a way, although it's not love bomb like we think about, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend, but it is love bombing in terms of making this person feel special, giving them a lot of attention. And then what happens is they start then kind of with these boundary encroachments, you know, they start hugging the person or they may start teasing them in a kind of playful way, you know, and, it's not, and they, they gauge the reaction. Peck would ultimately be arrested after he confessed to the crime on a recorded call. He pleaded no contest to oral copulation with a minor and performing a lewd act with a 14 or 15 year old. 
Peck would only spend 16 months in prison and was later required to register as a sex offender. One of the series' bombshells revealed several famous names offered letters of support, not to Drake Bell, but to Brian Peck. Some of the famous names included Amanda Show and Saturday Night Live alum Tarum Killam, James Marsden, Alan Thicke, as well as Boy Meets World stars Will Friedle and writer Strong. Friedle and Strong spoke about their regret in writing the letters back in a February episode of their podcast, Pod Meets World. But for Bell, their remorse didn't change how he remembered that day in court, where he says he saw a sea of famous faces defending the convicted child sex offender. During the podcast, Friedle said Peck misrepresented the charges against him, and looking back, he said he was on the wrong side of everything. During the fifth episode, Bell revealed he had worked with Friedle on Disney XD's Spider-Man and said there was a lot of opportunity for Friedle to apologize or talk about the letters written in favor of Peck, but Friedle never did. Bell explained he recognized it was a difficult subject matter to bring up in a work environment, but when asked if anyone reached out to him personally to apologize, Drake Bell said no. But in a tweet just two days prior to the fifth episode dropping, Bell said he did have a conversation with Ryder Strong, saying, quote, we are all healing together. I have nothing but love and forgiveness for him. Drake Bell also publicly defended his former on-screen brother, Josh Peck, who has no relation to Brian Peck. Josh Peck faced online backlash for not speaking out immediately after the first four episodes were released. But Bell explained Josh Peck reached out to him privately and said he understood it was a really difficult thing to process. In the episode, Bell also addressed his relationship with Dan Schneider, who was also a focal point of the series. Bell said Schneider was the only one from Nickelodeon that made an effort to help him and make sure he was okay throughout the ordeal. In a statement after the series' first four episodes aired, Nickelodeon said in part they were dismayed and saddened to learn about the trauma Bell endured and said they commend his strength and support to come forward. Over the course of the series, many former child actors, writers, and crew members alleged Schneider ran a toxic workplace, but Bell said he could only speak of his experience with Schneider. And in a new revelation, Shane Lyons, who appeared on the show All That for two seasons as a kid, recalled an inappropriate conversation he had with now convicted child sex offender Brian Peck. Lyons said Peck certainly made passes at him when he was then 13 or 14 years old. He recalled a particular conversation when Peck asked him what blue balls were. And being a kid at the time, Lyons said he thought they were racket balls. I think we would all agree that that is not an appropriate topic of conversation for an adult to be having with a 13-year-old boy, girl, whatever. Certainly not. That is very inappropriate. What that meant, I think it's very difficult to know. Thankfully, nothing seemed to have gone any further than that. And um, there also seems to be some very clear evidence that, you know, Brian Peck had no boundaries whatsoever in terms of sharing things and talking about John Wayne Gacy or, you know, his relationship with him. And I mean, those are things that are also completely not appropriate to be sharing with young children. And so it's hard to separate out. Was this the, the beginning of another grooming process or was this just a reflection of the fact that this person just, you know, was so out of touch with what is appropriate behavior with any teenager. And then of course we know that he knew what he was doing with Drake Bell was completely not only wrong, but illegal. After Peck's conviction, he would go on to work on another children's television series at a different children's network. Lyons also revealed there's a loophole that allowed Peck to get hired seemingly undetected. The loophole being as long as there's a parent or guardian on set, TV shows don't have to hire people who go through a background check. I have to tell you, I was absolutely flabbergasted by that. It just was astonishing to me. I mean, I don't even know what the what reasoning went into that. It's like, if the parents are on set, we don't have to do background checks. I mean, so parents are supposed to walk around and interview the people themselves. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense to me. And, you know, even if you want to be cynical for a minute, Elizabeth, and say, from a lawyer legal point of view, alone, now, I, I certainly think that the people who were, you know, hopefully decision makers cared about these children, their safety and well-being. But even if you don't want to believe that and you kind of go, no, they didn't. They were just concerned about money. You think, well, from a legal standpoint, you would think they'd be doing background checks on anybody who set foot on that step just for that reason, for liability reasons. So I just, you know, I cannot understand how that could have ever happened, that you would ever have anybody, I don't care if it's a freelancer, I don't care who it is, contract worker, whatever, on, on a set with children that you have not done a background check on. Lions former All That castmates Giovanni Samuels and Brian Hearn also reappeared in the fifth episode. And in another revelation, Samuel said Schneider reached out to her, 
but shortly before the series aired, asking if she could give a quote of support. Samuel said Schneider knew for a year that she'd be participating in the docuseries, but when asked if she had a good time on set, specifically when she returned to do Henry Danger, another show created by Schneider, she told the former Nickelodeon mega producer she was terrified of him, saying he had the power to make people stars, and she was intimidated by him and wanted to do a good job. Samuels would ultimately decline giving the statement of support to Schneider. After the first four episodes of the series were released, Schneider himself would go on to make a 20-minute apology video where he apologized for any hurt caused to those who worked with him. Watching over the past two nights was very difficult, me facing my past behaviors, um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret, and I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. Let's talk about the massages. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Schneider said in the video, in hindsight, some jokes crossed the line, but they were intended to be funny and for a children's audience. He said there are things he would have done differently, mainly the way he treated people on set. But for Samuels and Hearn, they weren't buying the apology. Hearn called the apology video a nice performance, adding where was the apology when Jeanette McCurdy's book came out, referring to Jeanette McCurdy's memoir, where she claimed to be exploited at the network. You know, I can't imagine what it would be like to sit down and watch four episodes of people basically calling you out and saying, you know, this is somebody who's now 20, 25 years older than he was back then. I'm hopeful that sitting down there and hearing you know, people over and over talk about the devastation that they felt and how humiliated they felt and how afraid they were on the one hand would have some impact. So that's my hope. The timing of it, though, I can't ignore. I mean, this person has had many, many years to reach out to, you know, to many of his, the people that work with him. Clearly, he was aware of how he was treating his female employees. He was aware of how people didn't like the things he was doing. So, you know, I, I cannot ignore the fact that this video has come out at this particular point in time. So I definitely think there is a PR point of part of it, for sure. And I am hopeful that, you know, also that there is, you know, that the fact that he's been exposed in the way that he has, and he's heard people talk to him in way, or, you know, or talk about him in ways that maybe he's never heard before, hopefully will have some consciousness raising. I think, you know, the proper way to apologize, obviously, is when there's nothing, you have nothing else to gain. You know, and when there, are, when there are other things to gain, it becomes very, very cloudy and people become very suspicious. So I think most people are open to somebody coming to them and saying, you know, I've really reflected on how I behaved and I was so wrong about this. And I apologize. I'm sorry. You know, if I, there's, what can I do to make up for it? Is there anything I can do to make up for it? So when you talk about apology, you know, we're looking for a couple of things. Somebody, number one, saying, I truly apologize. I take responsibility. Here's what I did for did to you. We want to know, what are you apologizing for? You know, are you apologizing, you know, because this has come out? No, I'm apologizing because I did A, B, C, and D, and I realized that was wrong. Um, and I take responsibility for that. Here's how I'm different now. And then it, it's, can I make amends in some way, right, going forward? Uh, there's that part of it as well. So I think that, you know, once things like this have come out, it's very, very difficult. During the series, both Samuels and Brian Hurd spoke candidly about working with Schneider on the hit children's show, All That, in the early 2000s. Hearn detailed one particular sketch where he was covered in peanut butter for dogs to lick off as a dare and could be heard in the clip saying he didn't like it, but the dare continued. He believed he was racially stereotyped by appearing in certain sketches featuring him as a rapper and even at points as a drug dealer type character, except he was selling cookies. Hearn's mother was also interviewed for the series and said she wasn't afraid to point out her discomfort when her son appeared in scenes she believed to be racially stereotypical, as well as pointing out adult jokes she thought were inappropriate for a children's show. Hearn's mother said she was asked to stay quiet, but ultimately it seemed like Hearn paid the price. He would later be let go and asked not to return as a cast member after two seasons. Hearn believes it was his mother's repeated questioning of the environment on set that would lead to his firing. And his mother says the day he was let go, everything changed between the two, as Hearn seemingly blamed his mother for his firing. Being a parent is tough. 
as somebody as a, a mom of four, it is tough. And certainly when a child becomes a teenager and, you know, let's just say that you have children and you do who their whole dream is to be an actor. And that's all they wanted to do. Um, we've talked before about the fact that, you know, it's important to separate your own dreams and wishes from your children's. But there are plenty of children out there who have been watching TV. They want to be the next iCarly or the next, you know, the next Drake Bell or whatever. And they are terrified that something's going to sabotage that. And so imagine that you are a parent and your child has been dragging you along to auditions and say, please pay for these acting lessons. And this is my dream is all I want to do. And then your child just gets on the show. And then you as a parent start seeing these things and you're like, you know, this is not right. I mean, this is not right. You are in a bind. And, you know, they'll say you talk it over with your child and your child says, don't say anything, mom, don't say anything, dad, because look what can happen. I think you have a very tough call to make. I would like to think as a parent that you make that call. Because as a parent, you are the one ultimately who's responsible for the physical and mental well-being of your child. And yes, that person is going to be disappointed. They're going to be angry with you. But think of what could happen if you're not speaking up for that child. Because by speaking up for that child, even if that child is angry with you, you are telling them through your actions, you are more important than what you're doing. You're, you're more important than being famous. I value you as my child and as a person more than any accomplishment you could ever have. As more former child stars are speaking out about the reckoning the industry is long overdue for, is there a way for child actors to have a safe experience while working on a Hollywood set? Dr. Johnson says yes, but only if change happens. I think that, you know, there's obviously the basics that we've talked about, which is just making sure that the, just the physical safety, those background checks are done, that there's, I mean, that's just, like necessary. And I mean, that's not even like a, a bonus part. But I do think that um, it's very, very important for any network that has children on there that, or they have um, teenagers on there, that they have support for parents. They have resources for parents to, you know, kind of network with other parents who are in that same, in that same space. And they also have you know, resources for children whether it's on set or they have resources in the community that they have more awareness of child development, you know, and what is appropriate, that they are really conscious of working hours and, and those kinds of things. And, and just, they just need to have a lot more, I think, knowledge, whether that's learning it or whether that's hiring people who can help them do that. Because, you know, you're not, children are always changing and they're always growing. And because of that, they're vulnerable to, to things that happen to them. So I think it's very, very important for them to really take responsibility for the fact that if we're going to have hire children, if we're going to have children who are doing this, we're responsible for promoting and, and maintaining, helping them maintain their well-being while they're working with us. At this time, Nickelodeon has not released a statement in response to the newest episode of Quiet on Set. In a previous statement, Nickelodeon said, quote, though we cannot corroborate or negate allegations of behavior from productions decades ago, Nickelodeon, as a matter of policy, investigates all formal complaints as a part of our commitment to fostering a safe and professional workplace environment free of harassment or other kinds of inappropriate conduct. Reporting for Law and Crime, I'm Elizabeth Milner.